So I'm very sorry to cut off the conversations, but I've got to ask if you would please join us here now. And if you need to continue your conversation, I'd certainly understand, but I'd ask you to take it outside. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford Silicon Valley Energy Summit 2017 lunchtime debate. Uh, I understand people need to get up and move around. That's perfectly OK. We're a little informal here during the lunch hour. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of our listeners that are on the internet today. At lunchtime, this is being uh, broadcast live. I'd, and my name is Jeff Byron. Um, I'll be your moderator today. Unfortunately, our expert moderator, who's in the program, Jeff Ball, uh, was not able to be with us because of personal reasons. And I know he misses this terribly and sends his regrets. Uh, he's been with us the last couple of years. So I was chosen to be the moderator because my name is the closest to Jeff Ball's. <laughs> Jeff Byron, I'm next in the alphabetical order. Um, uh, actually, I am one of the conference organizers, uh, a former California Energy Commissioner. I'm somewhat versed on this subject and uh, one of the principal organizers of today's debate. So I'll do my best to replace the other Jeff. The debate topics from the past two years have been the highlight of the summit because of their topical interest, the expert panels, panelists, and our informed audience. Uh, we've had some lively debates on the adoption of electric vehicles, on a renaissance of nuclear power, and I think you'll find today's topic just as interesting. It's resolved the benefits to the United States of fracking shale oil and gas outweigh the environmental costs. Now, if you think there's nothing to debate here, think again. There's a lot at stake for the economy, the environment, and the health and safety of all Americans. Oil and natural gas recovery from shale oil fracking has quietly transformed domestic production. It has significantly lowered prices, yet it may have a substantial impact on our environment. It's a difficult topic. It's difficult for discussion because it's problematic to accept the environmental impacts while enjoying the economic and security benefits of cheap fossil fuels. Now, we, we know the benefits to the economy. They include lower gasoline and heating and electricity prices, savings for consumers, um, higher stock market valuations, increased GDP, and improved balance of trade. However, these benefits are not without environmental and health impacts. Lower costs lead to increased consumption more criteria pollutants, greenhouse gases, environmental degradation of land at drilling sites, groundwater contamination, and increased seismic activity. We have a dilemma, and we, we need answers. So today we're debating topics such as how do we reduce greenhouse gas production when domestic oil and natural gas shale production continue to increase unabated. Although there may be alternatives to low-cost oil and natural gas, do we forsake this boon to the U.S. economy? Do the security and economic benefits of lower production costs outweigh the environmental costs? And what kind of example are we setting for the rest of the world to reduce greenhouse gases if we continue down this path? So how many of you were here for one of the last two debates in the last previous years. Excellent. So you have an idea of the format. I'll be quick through this. You may recall we had some difficulty determining a winner. I'm hopeful that we can um, resolve that. Anonymous. So now, so we're trying, <laughs> we're trying something new. And uh, somebody's typed in an anonymous uh, question here, so I don't know where this is coming from or how to control this, but please don't, okay? <laughs> so let's see if I can override this. There we go. Here's a test question. What you need to do is you need to log into that website that was up earlier, slido.com. Let's go back to that previous screen so you can see it. Can we bring up the, um, well, it's on the left-hand side of this. Slido.com, and you need to input 
um, under the, um, uh, the topic, the event code is debate 2017, and you go to, the, go to the polls tab. You can do it on your phone, your iPad, computer, whatever. And I'd like everybody to participate in this. And, um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to bring up just a test question to see how you all uh, do with regard to logging into this. So let me open this up. Okay, the voting should be open, says at the top. No, nope, just closed. All right. Voting, active poll. So please go right ahead and we'll watch some numbers spin by at the top. Gives us an idea of how the voting is going. I just would like to take just a little bit of time to get you all in there. This is not as crucial, obviously, as the next question. This is just a test. How's everybody doing? Anybody, if you're having problems, raise your hand. Ask the person next to you for help. All right, I'm just going to shut this off because all we really need to do is test the question. Let's just see how the results come up. No, they will, they will. I got to close the poll. Unfortunately, I was hoping to be able to do this all with my computer, but Stanford won't let me log in because I have a former Stanford address. All right, well, good. So look at that. So giants, of course, tonight, which means we have the faithful here today, although not in highest numbers as I might have expected. All right, so let's shut that down. So again, I don't, I, I don't know where these anonymous are coming from or how to shut them off, and I apologize. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it didn't go well in my, this didn't happen in my test. So I think we're ready. Uh, the resolution, again, is the debates the, excuse me, the benefits to the U.S. of fracking shale oil and gas outweigh the environmental costs. Many of you have formed your opinion already. This group will try and change your minds or at least not lose your support. However, you can also be undecided. That's okay when you start the debate. The winners of the debate are those who change the most votes to their side. So let's bring that screen back up again. Let's make sure we're vote unlocked. All right, hopefully this supersedes. So here you go, please log in and, uh, and give us your vote. We'll let that roll for a while while I go over the uh, format for the debate and provide some introductions. The protagonists are Mark Zoback. He's the Benjamin, Benjamin M. Page Professor of Earth Sciences and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy. He directs the Natural Gas Initiative at Stanford. Dane Boyson, I'm going to, uh, to, to my left here, is the chief technologist, Cyclotron Road, former executive director of research operations at the Gas Technology Institute, and he was a program director at ARPA-E. The antagonists, the ladies, Brianna Mordick, she's senior scientist, land and wildlife and climate programs at NRDC, and a uh, former geologist, for the rather poorly named company, Anna Darko Petroleum. <laughs> Lena Moffat, all the way to the left, is the director of the Dirty Fuels campaign for the Sierra Club. And she was formerly, uh, she led the National Wildlife Federation's climate and energy program. Just in case nobody gets any clapping later on, let's make sure we give them a hand on that. I can't thank you all enough for being here. It's very kind of you. So this is an Oxford-style debate. Let me go over the rules very quickly. Each speaker will get an opening statement. We'll begin with the first speaker for the motion. They will have three minutes. Then the first speaker against the motion. Then we will have rebuttal speakers for and against. Each will be three minutes. Then I'll pose some questions to each side, and we'll be more interactive for about 30 minutes. We'll have closing statements of two minutes each in the same order, and then we'll conclude with a second vote on the resolution to see who persuaded the most audience members and won the debate. But first, let's check and see how the audience feels about this issue going in. Ah. All right. Our job's easy. So I don't want you to worry if you didn't get your vote in on the first one. It's obviously the second vote that matters the most. Uh, but as you can see, panelists, you have your work cut out for you. 
I'll be keeping a stopwatch and I'll ask you to suspend if you exceed your time. Uh, let's begin with opening remarks. Mark, would you like to come up here or would you like to stay right there? Oh, I'll just stay here. Okay, <clears throat> go right ahead. Uh, start the timer, please. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, about three years ago, after 30 years on the faculty, I also agreed to take on uh, the responsibility as the director of Stanford's Natural Gas Initiative. So why did I do this? Why did the university do it? Uh, we did it because there were so many important and obvious environmental benefits of the utilization of natural gas that there was a, a lot of issues to engage and a lot of progress to be made. So it's somewhat ironic uh, to be asked to argue for the motion that these benefits uh, outweigh the environmental costs when in fact it was the environmental benefits that sort of got me into this business in the first place. There's no, there's no question that to limit global warming we have to decarbonize the global energy system as quickly as possible. Replacing coal burning power plants with natural gas is doing this today at a very significant scale in the US and could be doing it in many other countries around the world. There's also no question that we have to address the severe air pollution in countries like China from burning coal and the equally severe air pollution in countries like India from using dirty diesel for transportation. We also have to curtail the cum cumulative legacy of the environmental problems associated with coal everywhere, including here in the United States. And finally, there's no question that we have to find ways to promote economic growth in the developing world. Countries in the developing world are building coal burning power plants at an alarming rate. We need to provide energy that is as clean as possible as quickly as possible. 1.3 billion people today have no access to electricity. Four million people are dying every year due to indoor air pollution associated with burning dung and burning coal. The global abundance of natural gas, provided in large part by horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, provides us with a critically needed option for addressing all of these pressing issues. Natural gas is an ideal fuel to decarbonize and cause less pollution in the energy system in the future. It is not the end, it is a means to get to a decarbonized energy world. Finally, the motion we're arguing today that the benefits of, to the US of fracking shale oil and gas outweigh the environmental costs is predicated on the assumption that there are insurmountable environmental problems that will have to be endured to realize these benefits. Well, there have been over 250,000 horizontal wells and multi-stage hydraulic fractures carried out in North America, mostly in the last 10 to 12 years. And the assertion that this has caused, or will soon cause, severe environmental damage is simply not true and needlessly alarmist. Through emphasizing best practice, appropriate regulation, and enforcement of those regulations, I have every confidence that horizontal drilling and multi-stage fracturing can be done with minimal environmental impact. Thank you very much. Oh, applause. You're all very good. This is fantastic. Okay, now against the resolution, three minutes. Is, do I understand it's Lena? Please. Well, thank you so much. appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about why the impacts of fracking vastly outweigh the benefits. Uh, fracking is inherently a risky process. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is a process that entails mixing large amounts of water with toxic chemicals under high pressure and injecting it miles beneath the surface of the earth to fracture rock to release hydrocarbons. Now, as logic would lead you to believe, that's a process that comes with a lot of risks. And if any of you have had the opportunity to go out and meet with the families living amongst fracking rigs and living directly adjacent to them sometimes, more than 15 million Americans live within a mile of a fracking rig, you will know that the impacts are very real and that they cannot be ignored. For instance, I've had the opportunity to meet with families who've been forced to go without running water in their homes because using the water that was coming out of their faucets was causing their children to have nosebleeds to have rashes on their faces, on their skin, to be unable to go to school because they were so nauseous and so dizzy. Those families were then forced to rely entirely on bottled water purchased out of their own pockets from their local grocery store. 
I also work with colleagues in states like Oklahoma who have felt the very real impacts of the incredible increase in earthquakes that have been triggered by the fracking process and the wastewater injection wells that the fracking industry is now using to dispose of the billions of gallons of toxic wastewater that the process triggers every year. Our Oklahoma chapter director has told me a really upsetting story about his eight-year-old daughter waking up in the middle of the night, running down the hallway terrified to his bedroom because their house was shaking from yet another earthquake. Before 2009, Oklahoma experienced about two earthquakes a year, and since the advent of the tens of thousands of deep wastewater injection wells, they now experience a thousand significant earthquakes a year. That is a huge increase. But the fact of the matter is you don't have to take my word for it. There is a growing body of peer-reviewed scientific evidence that has demonstrated a quantifiable specific harm from fracking to public health, the environment, and our climate. For instance, studies have shown that Natural gas, including fracking, releases significant amounts of carbon pollution. It is not a way to decarbonize our economy. Methane, which is a highly potent greenhouse gas emission, 86 times as potent as CO2 at trapping heat over a 20-year time frame, leaks from the entire fracking life cycle. Other studies have demonstrated the public health impacts of fracking. For instance, the toxic chemicals associated with fracking, like benzene, toluene, and xylene, are known not only to cause cancer, cardiovascular impacts, but they've also been shown to cause birth defects. A 40% increase for women who live near a fracking rig for preterm births. 30% increase in uh, women who would give birth to a baby with a congenital heart disease. Twice as likely to give birth to a baby with a neural tube defect. These, uh, these impacts are real, they are significant, and they cannot be ignored. And because of all of those impacts, I say they vastly outweigh the benefits of fracking. Thank you. You must be very encouraged that the former Attorney General of Oklahoma is now the Secretary of the EPA then. It's, it's a scary world we live in. So, rebuttal. Uh, Dane, three minutes. Wow, she's good. <laughs> um, so last Sunday I called my parents uh, for Father's Day. Uh, I told them that I was going to be participating uh, on, the, on this debate about the benefits of fracking and the co environmental costs. And my mom's response was, fracking? That, that sounds bad. <laughs> and I thought, then she asked, well, what side are you on? And I thought, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> uh, so I, actually, I spent most of my career uh, actually developing alternative energy technology. Um, uh, rich scale batteries at MIT. Uh, we had, I had a fuel cell company uh, later on worked for RPE investing in alternative energy technologies. So you may wonder how it is that I came here uh, to defend unconventional oil and gas development, aka fracking. Um, and at this moment, I'm kind of wondering the same thing. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it's pretty simple. Um, as a scientist, uh, the thing I value the most uh, above pretty much anything else is, is the truth. And, and facts matter, and the truth matters. And there is so much misinformation around um, fracking out there that I believe uh, I'm obligated to present its case. The truth is, um, my friends uh, have some legitimate concerns about fracking. Um, but uh, environmental acti activism did not kill coal. It was the success of unconventional oil and gas development. And uh, the truth is, the success of fracking uh, is not the horror story you've been told. In fact, it's the opposite. It is an American story uh, that is the result of uh, over 30 years of public-private effort, starting the Carter administration after uh, the 1970 OPEC crisis where the Department of Energy and the Gas Research Institute funded R&D into advanced fracking, directional drilling, and underground mapping technologies. Um, ultimately, it wasn't big oil, but the visionary entrepreneur, George Mitchell, who successfully cracked the code of shale gas and produced the first uh, profitable well in Texas Barnett. And let's not forget, uh, it was the, the importance of the unconventional tax credit, which uh, created the market incentive to bring this unconventional gas to market. So the, the truth is, uh, these developments um, 
and unconventional gas have put us on a path towards energy and independence, uh, making us safer and the world safer. Um, they've added 1.2 trillion to the GD US GDP and 9.3 million jobs. They've reduced the carbon intensity and emissions per capita to the lowest levels in 30 years. Uh, they've increased energy efficiency and economic productivity. So in closing, the truth matters. Uh, the truth is unconventional oil and gas is the single greatest advancement we've had uh, in energy infrastructure in the last half century. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dan. So now we have uh, the rebuttal against the resolution, Brianna. Three Thank minutes. You. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, I agree completely with my opponent that the basic facts and truth matter and are what is important. And the basic fact is that burning fossil fuels is fundamentally changing our planet in a way that threatens the continued existence of humanity. And the way to stop that is to deeply and rapidly decar decarbonize our economy. So the proposition is about environmental costs, but let's just say you're somebody who doesn't care about global warming or ocean acidification or all the very real impacts of extraction that Lena just talked about. You should still want to stop using fossil fuels to generate energy. And the reason is because fossil fuels are also finite. We are gonna run out of them one day, and if we wait until we run out of them to come up with alternatives, we are going to also plunge ourselves into chaos. So when you think about those two things, and you think about the fact that we burning fossil fuels inevitably leads to chaos for human society, the idea of continuing the fossil fuel era, of continuing to burn fossil fuels, is in the words of Elon Musk, the stupidest experiment in history. <laughs> and it's even stupider when you think about the fact that, as we are hearing today, the alternatives are readily available. They're increasingly cost competitive, if not cheaper, than the traditional sources. And by continuing to extend this era of fossil fuels, we are risking additional lock-in of infrastructure that's going to make it more difficult for us to extract ourselves from using fossil fuels and create a, a huge potential economic problem with all the stranded assets that we're continuing to invest in. So, you know, as the saying goes, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of rocks. And as a society, we have a moral imperative to not wait until we run out of fossil fuels to leave the fossil fuel era, because the environmental costs vastly outweigh the benefits. Very good. So thank you all very much. You were on time, and that's appreciated very much. But it gives us a little more time for some discussion. Uh, this next period will be a little more interactive with us here on stage, but let's take up where you, where you just left us. The, we didn't, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Uh, I'm sure everyone would like to see the fossil age end at some point. Is it an issue of speed? Is it possible? Why isn't it happening? Why aren't we making this transformation? I'll Gentlemen, let's go to you first. <laughs> Unless you don't well, want it. No, I, I, th I think we are making this transformation. And, you know, w what we're looking at is just kind of a, you know, a step in this progression of, of decarbonization. Certainly fuel switching is, is part of that. Uh, you know, oil is tough because, uh, you know, in this country, in many countries, oil is principally used for transportation and we have no viable alternatives. Now we all are, you know, looking to the electrification of uh, the transportation system. But there's you know, 250 million cars in the United States. There's a billion cars and light duty trucks in the world. And it would be great to see all of those electrified. But it's gonna take a tremendous amount of net generation. It's gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to rebuild the grids. We're gonna have to solve the storage problem. And we're gonna have to replace this fleet. So that's not gonna happen overnight. But it needs to happen. It should happen. We totally, I think Dan and I, totally agree we have to stop burning fossil fuels. The question is whether you know, we just oppose everything, that we only look at fossil fuels as a problem and not part of the solution. And I think they can be part of the solution, but we, we agree about where we're trying to go. We just, I think, disagree about how we're going to get there. Yeah, and I'd like to kind of add to that, you know, having been on the R&D side of developing energy storage, just give you like kind of a back of the envelope. Yeah, the U.S. uses about 4,000 terawatt hours per year uh, of electricity. Um, if you say that you need batteries to shore up 
for eight hours a day your solar and wind, and at $100 per kilowatt hour, you're talking about $200, $200 trillion investment uh, at 10 times the US GDP. So we're not there yet on the R&D. I'd love it if we were. And uh, we certainly need, uh, we need some incentives, that what, through, probably through policy, to drive some of these technologies faster. But uh, we can't switch because we don't have sufficient alternatives yet. Oh, I suspect we may get an op opposing view over here. <laughs> well, I'll take a crack at that one. I think we're not making the transition because the fossil fuel industry is a very well-vested player in our political system. The rest of the world is starting to make this transition, and we are significantly lagging behind. And I agree, fossil fuels are not going to go away overnight or even tomorrow. But I also agree that we very much need to start making that transition as quickly as we possibly can to actually decarbonize our grid. And yet, the fossil fuel industry is racing towards expanding our reliance on fossil fuels at a time when we need to be doing the opposite. The Energy Information Administration is projecting a 55% increase in gas extraction in the United States and a 24% increase in reliance over the next couple of decades. That's the opposite direction that we need to be going in. And honestly, I don't think that's going to change. We're not going to see the kinds of incentives that we need to really drive investments in low carbon, truly low carbon technologies until we have elected officials who are going to demand that we do so. And right now, the, the fossil fuel industry is paying to perpetuate the status quo. So let's dr drill down on that for a second. Because uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, when you deploy solar, you need to somehow address the intermittency. And there was a study just came out that basically showed a very strong correlation that you actually have to add natural gas to get more renewables into the, ener in, in, into the energy system. So. It's just, just not that simple. Did you want to add anything? Well, I would say studies have also shown that we do not need to add the amount of additional capacity that the gas industry is pursuing to transition to a low carbon economy. That's just not true. OK. Um. <laughs> I'm wondering, is it, it might just be right? I don't know. Yeah. Is that it might be true? I, you know, I think questions like that are going to get resolved in the marketplace. That's right. And, and it, it's uh, it, good point. It'll it'll happen naturally. Well, but the problem, I, you know, which is you know, kind of what Lena was getting at, is that the oil industry has been the dominant player in this field for a long time, and they're not getting the signal from the market that what they're doing is a problem. There's not a price on carbon. There's no signal. You know, it's a huge market failure. The fact that they can release unlimited amounts of CO2, and there's no penalty for that. So maybe the market will correct itself, but some policy is going to have to be put in place to to cause that market correction. And the reason but, but, we have wait, the reason we have our government is to help put a price on those externalities that are not reflected in the market right now. And like we just talked about, there are a significant number of externalities that are very real associated with continued use of oil and gas, and they're not reflected in the marketplace right now. And the fossil fuel industry is fighting to keep it that way so that they can maintain the status quo. I'm up on Capitol Hill almost every day in DC. Their lobbyists are there, and they outrank us incredibly. The fossil fuel industry has enjoyed this benefit of billions of dollars of subsidies and a lot of cash that they can use to hire lobbyists, and they're fighting for it. They're up there outnumbering us, and we need people to get engaged to ensure that we actually are incentivizing low carbon. So energy. I want to make sure we're arguing against fracking here, not just fossil fuels, right? I mean, your argument is against fossil fuels in general. Yes, although I would say that fossil fuels is quickly starting to mean oil and gas. I think our, my colleagues over here are right. The era of coal is going away, and gas is rapidly replacing it, at least in the United States. And what so, we as a society need to do is ensure that we're not expanding reliance on gas, but that we are going to renewable energy technologies that don't pass in the climate crisis or poison our communities. So unless you control the marketplace, isn't going to natural gas instead of coal a good thing? Yeah, that, that's what I was going, going to say. It, it, it's, a, it's an evolutionary step in decarbonization. And, and the remarkable thing is it's, it's, you know, we now have an unlimited amount of natural gas, which means we have more than we'll ever burn. So we can use it as part of a decarbonization strategy. You know, we don't have energy storage. We don't have a grid that's capable. We don't have enough deployment of wind and solar. We will solve all those problems at some time in the future. But in the meantime, 
you know, in the meantime, we can cut CO2 emissions in half and deal with all of these other, you know, tremendous uh, environmental penalties that comes along with coal. So why not do that? Why wait for these perfect solutions? You know, when you, when you go to the developing world and you see a solar panel on a, you know, on the roof of a little hut, that's good. Everybody can agree to that. It's good, it's clean, they have light, um, they can, you know, use that energy. But that's not a basis for building, you know, economic growth in these places to lift these people out of poverty. Now, maybe someday there will be, you know, sufficient deployment of renewables, but in the meantime, you know, natural gas can help, you know, fill that need as well. Because right now, the developing world puts out a few solar panels. At the same time, they're building lots of coal-burning power plants because it's the cheapest and easiest thing to do. Well, I'd much rather see them put out more solar panels and replace those coal-burning power plants with natural gas power plants. Everybody wins, and eventually it'll be time, in the, you know, both in this country and around the world, for those gas plants to be replaced. But let's take this one step at a time. We, we have the means to do that. We don't have to wait. And the technology development that we need for a sustainable energy future will, will happen in parallel while we're doing a lot of good things uh, at the same time. Do, do, you, do you contest the notion that uh, shale fracking uh, and uh, access to lower cost natural gas is increasing, I mean, sorry, decreasing the, uh, the use of fossil fuels? The use of coal. Use of coal. No, I mean, I think that's clear, but I think the, the piece that's the key to that is, you know, you, you go back and look at the, the way the, you know, world in this country has used resources over time, and you can look at the graphs of it. You know, we started with wood, it peaked and it dropped off. We were using oil, it peaked and it dropped off. We're in the era of natural gas now, we are, but we can't wait for that drop off to happen on its own. We have to be much more aggressive if we have any chance of meeting the targets that the world's best scientists say that we have to meet if we want to avoid the worst costs of climate change. We don't have time to let the market figure that out on its own. We need government policies, aggressive government policies, to ensure that we're going to move off natural gas much quicker than what would happen just naturally under the market. <laughs> I think we would agree agree with that, um, but you know, kind of going back to Mark's point about how long it takes to change an infrastructure fuel, it takes a long time. And one of the reasons I introduced the history part of how we got to unconventional gas development is to give you a sense of like what that takes, and that that, that in fact was a pretty uh, successful model. And we need something more aggressive than that if we're going to address climate change. And, you know, just to put things in perspective, where were we, uh, you know, in the last 50 years? You know, we, we actually have seen the single greatest transfer of wealth in human history from the United States to other countries, to, to countries that don't necessarily share our value, um, that create fear mm -hmm. in the world. Um, countries like Canada. <laughs> uh, you, and, and now, by 2026, we're estimated to be a net energy exporter. That's a big deal. And it, have we solved the climate change? Well, in 1970, the climate change wasn't the issue. But what they did that was appropriate is they put the po tax policies in place, the R&D in the place, it was a public-private partnership, and it takes time. And even if we accelerate, it's going to take time. So I just want to try and sharpen the issue a little more with regard to fracking, okay? Uh, I'd like to, I mean, clearly the audience has indicated they're interested in getting rid of fossil fuels as well. But let's sharpen it with regard to fracking. Is the environmental issue for fracking better or worse? In other words, if we weren't fracking shale oil, getting this enormous domestic supply, this abundance that, that um, what did you say, uh, Mark, that it's too cheap to meter? No, you said, um, being facetious, we have more we'll than never we'll, run we'll out. We have more than we'll ever use. Yes. So, so I want to sharpen it with regard to fracking. Is indeed fracking environmentally worse than not doing fracking? I'll take that one, and I and I also want to respond to something Mark said of why not go down that path. And I think the the reasons are ample, particularly when when we consider the opportunity of non polluting zero carbon energy technologies that are on the rise and are increasingly affordable. And if we 
as a society really doubled down on those, we wouldn't have to suffer all of these other myriad impacts. And I think the why not really is captured by the specific impacts that have been demonstrated as a result of the impacts of fracking. We mentioned public health impacts like birth defects. I, mean, I would say that if we're asking 15 million Americans to potentially choose between the health of their family, the health of their baby, and a good job, that is not a question that we should be asking those people to have to answer, particularly, again, when we could be investing in these clean energy technologies. The other why not is because a lot of the new analysis is showing that methane pollution from the entire life cycle of the gas production process, from fracking to upgrading to transmission, vastly erodes the climate benefit that gas, we used to think, gas enjoyed. Some studies indicate that it may be as bad for the climate as coal. So you add to that that it is a carbon emitting fuel, it's not decarbonizing the economy, and you have all of these local impacts of extraction, I think the answer, why not, is really clear, because we have better alternatives. Can, can I address the methane? Please, go right ahead. I'd like, I'd like to address the methane issue, and the met, methane is an, a very important issue, and it's a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, fortunately, we have some uh, really great people here at, at Stanford um, working on this, and I'll, I'll tell you what I've learned from them, because I haven't studied it myself. So there's far more methane in the atmosphere than we thought a few years ago, no question about it, and that's bad. Um, I don't know if any of you, if you ever have a chance, Google a thousand years or even 10,000 years of methane in the atmosphere. It's an absolutely fascinating plot, and it's been going up since the dawn of the uh, industrial age, mostly following population. So methane has been increasing in the atmosphere very fast for hundreds of years due to a wide variety of sources. But in terms of the, the methane in the atmosphere now that it exceeds what you know, we thought it was, over half of it is coming from agri agricultural sources, okay? A little bit more than half. A little bit less than half is coming from the oil and gas industry. Methane, the climate modelers tell us, is responsible for about 25% of the warming. So it's not trivial. It is important. But again, the oil and gas industry is responsible for about half of that. So it's a 10 to 12% contributor to global warming. That's a lot, and that needs to be addressed and methane is a real issue. So where is the methane coming from? This is the interesting thing, is the methane is coming from a few but very large leaks that are usually due to somebody screwing up, somebody not closing a valve, somebody not covering a, a latch cover. And uh, my colleague Adam Brandt uh, has led a group that says that about one in 2,000 leaks is responsible for more than 50% of that excess methane. You know, we have 250,000 miles of large pipelines. We have between two and three million miles of dis distribution pipelines. And there are problems in all of these systems. So what we need is a system that doesn't fret over every valve, every connection, every wellhead, but a system that's de designed to find these big leaks and to fix them as quickly as possible. And those systems are coming on board, both the detection systems, the utilization of those systems, and the response uh, once you know something's happening. So methane is real. Methane doesn't come anywhere close to offsetting the benefit of using um, natural gas instead of coal. It's, but it, it's not a trivial issue. I totally agree. It's important. But its importance has been overblown, you know, just simply to, to, to make the case for coal Come on, this is what's really we're talking about. Because, you know, renewables are coming along. Maybe not as fast as we like, but they're coming along. There's all sorts of reasons to do it, and, and they are cost competitive. It's just absolutely great. But the energy system is so big, and it's going to take so long that when you argue against, you know, natural gas, what you're really doing is saying, well, let's just keep burning coal until we can start shutting off, you know, the uh, coal burning power plants a few decades from now. Well, you know, that's, that's time we shouldn't be wasting. We, you know, a few more decades of coal is a few, too, a, a few more decades too much as far as I'm concerned. Brianna, let's hear from you on the safety issue. Is there a way that we can do hydraulic fracturing safe enough? Can we control the methane cycle so that it doesn't make the enormous contribution to GHG that, that uh, Lena mentioned? 
Well, I, I mean, I think the issue. Will you concede something? <laughs> Never. <laughs> uh, I, I think the issue of fracking has become a little bit of a, a red herring that the industry, and, and granted, maybe the other side as well, can use to hold up to make the point that they want. And often the point the industry makes is there's not, you know, fr hydraulic fracturing, fracking has never contaminated groundwater. When they're talking about it, they're talking about this narrow process that's one step in the full process that's required to get oil and gas out of the ground. Often when the other side uses the term fracking, they're talking about the whole process. So to just talk about fracking, you know, you're kind of missing the, the bulk of the problem. You know, the, the environmental impacts that are caused by producing oil and gas aren't that different whether you're fracking or not fracking. You're threatening air, you're threatening water, you're threatening land. And there are ways to reduce those impacts. They'll never be reduced to zero. But part of the problem that we've seen, and you know, this is the same with the methane issue, industry will not do that voluntarily. There are readily available solutions to deal with the methane problem. I totally agree with Mark. But we've seen time and time again that industry doesn't want to do that on their own. You need government intervention to make those sorts of things happen. The EPA has had a, a program for, for decades called the EPA Methane or the Gas Star Program, which was to encourage operators to voluntarily reduce their methane emissions. I think something only like 20% of the industry voluntarily participated in that program. And the reason is that a dollar invested in drilling new well brings them a lot more money than a dollar invested in capturing methane. So again, you have to correct these fundamental market failures. The industry doesn't have the motivation to clean up its problems on its own, to, to stop releasing methane, to, to not pollute groundwater. That's not where their interest okay. lies. Thane, do you want to give a quick response? I have a few more questions I want to try and get to in the time we've got. Sure, just to, I mean, uh, there was a, a recent study that came out of NASA, iso isotopic measurement to see what concentration of the methane in the atmosphere that was actually coming from fossil. They found was actually, uh, first, not going to lie, they, they, it was a lot more than they thought, 60 to 100 percent more, but it was also uh, about significantly less than it was the previous five or six years that they made the previous measurement. So their observation, even though production was going up, actually methane emissions from the industry is going down. So uh, personally, I, I, I I, I agree with Brianna. There's always, it, it's very difficult to regulate industry. Um, but in general, the industry seems to be, to a certain extent, regulating themselves. And I think the states have ste stepped up uh, to the challenge of doing some of the regulations. And uh, they are making positive, moving things in a positive direction, at least on the methane. All right, can, good. Can I, uh, Please go right ahead. Be, be quick, Mark. I want to get to yeah, a few okay. more things. Brianna made two points, and I agree with both of them. Hydraulic fracturing is one step in the oil and gas development process that's singled out and everything that's wrong that can occur is called hydraulic fracturing. So let's fix the problems where they arise. And hydraulic fracturing has not caused contamination, but there's a lot of contamination caused by the oil and gas industry. So let's find out what's going wrong and, and let's fix it. And the other thing you said is that it, you know, there's a market failure, and there is a market failure, and that's why we need adequate regulations and control. So okay. I, I totally I think that's a concession. I totally agree with you. Well, we, we agree with that from the beginning. All right, good. So I apologize. We only have about five more minutes, maybe six, left in, in, in this period before we get to our close. And I want to ask a few more things. I want to get more on the, excuse me, on the economic benefits. So I'll go, I'll go to this side first. Um, what about the energy security aspect of domestic fracturing? I mean. When, when I was an energy commissioner, we never foresaw the benefits that would come from this in terms of the, the United States being a domestic producer of fossil fuels. You know, we have been importing fossil fuels. We were going to build an awful lot of natural gas LNG terminals. There's, clearly, there must be some benefit to not having to go to war in the Middle, of e Middle East to protect our access to the fossil fuels that we seem to demand. Will you concede that there is some economic benefit? Can you take that? Yeah, we can go. I can say something about it too, but go ahead. Uh, if not, yes. we'll turn it over I to these guys. <laughs> I think we can concede that there have been a significant amount of profits made for a handful of companies, a large number of jobs created, and I, I readily admit that. I'm the daughter of a construction worker. I know the importance of having jobs in this country. The part that we won't concede is that I think the impacts have been understudied. They've been under-considered as we think about our energy future in this country. And one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the opportunity cost of the other investments that we could be making. Again, the more that this country continues to double down on fracking, on continued reliance on oil and gas, expanded reliance on those two fuels, we are foregoing 
critical investments in the clean energy technologies that are going to power the economy of tomorrow that other countries are racing to invest in, and we're missing out on that opportunity. And I think that's a cost that needs to be considered. Gentlemen, response? Economic benefit, domestic shale fracking. Well, I, I think if we want to stop burning fossil, you know, f stop importing fossil fuels, we should stop burning them, right? And the, you know, the issue of, you know, we're, we're you know, 2007, we were importing 12 million barrels of oil a day. Uh, currently, we're importing less than half of that. Some of it is depressed, you know, uh, demand. A lot of it is energy efficiency. And about, you know, four to five million barrels a day is from domestic production. That's better than importing oil, and I think it's a, you know, it's a big deal and has had a positive impact on our economy and, and gives us flexibility in foreign policy, and uh, let's not, you know, spend any, you know, blood and treasure securing uh, oil for the future. Um, natural gas has been a boon, you know, uh, both consumers and, um, and industry have benefited from very low gas prices now for, for a decade, and that's, that's great. It doesn't diminish, you know, the need to decarbonize the energy system at all. These things should be happening in, in parallel. Dane, let me ask you a different question. Um, I think the people that, that probably in our audience voted against this proposition, and maybe everybody, wants to know, is it realistic to expect that we will see shale fracking and domestic shale fracking yield to renewables? Will that happen? And why isn't it happening? When will it happen? Well, this is where I think we're some agreement on both sides here. That, look, there's a there's some sort of mar there's a market failure. We need there needs to be policy put in place that is like you know developing technology. I can't tell you how hard it is to get new technology out there competing with something that's been around for millions of years. Uh, it's very difficult, and without a price on carbon, it's it's almost impossible. And so we need, we need a comprehensive energy policy. There's no disagreement, at least not, not for me, uh, on this. Um, so I don't disagree with that. And until we have that, honestly, that is probably, should be the number one thing. Because once we have a price on carbon, then the companies start to allocate their investment resources towards the technologies. So until we really get that in place, you know, I, I get what they're, 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 they're driving for their argument. And, the, the tactic of obstructionism is a secondary one to the one that they can't really get through, which is some comprehensive policy. So, Response? Well, I mean, yeah, I think, as you said, this is an area where, you know, we, we broadly agree. Um, but there may, I'm not sure if there's a disagreement about how, how fast we need to do it, but I think that's the, the crux of it is, you know, while we may have this sort of, you know, what I think is probably an illusory kind of energy security for the moment. It's not a lasting energy security as long as it's that security is relying on fossil fuels. So we need those policies. We need them rapidly. We need the market corrections to take place because, yeah, I think he's right. You know, it, it is incredibly difficult for disruptors to break into this market because the oil and gas industry doesn't have to pay for its negative externalities. Mm -hmm. Can I add? add Please to it? go. Just to give you some idea of what an un unconventional, the unconventional gas tax, um, when George Mitchell started producing unconventional gas, it was about a billion dollar a year subsidy. And it was about $1 per million BTU when gas was around $3 per million BTU. So it was a significant, we need a similar kind of market incentive on the carbon side for alternative technologies to start to, to break in. Well, I was hoping to end on a more controversial subject, and we only have a minute or two left. So let me, let me turn maybe unfairly to the, to, to the antagonists. I keep hearing you referring to fossil fuel. This debate was about hydraulic fracturing, OK? Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, Lena, you said earlier something to the effect that, um, well, if you will, I'll paraphrase. Taking uh, we know that methane, the methane cycle is bad, and we and which which organization is taking credit for burying coal over here? I forget. <laughs> that would probably be us. Yes, of course. <laughs> so now, are we against natural gas in general, as well, and oil in general? Is that really the issue here? That uh, it, it's not about fracking; it's about we're against fossil fuel. 
Well, I would say, as Brianna referred to, studies have indicated that if we are going to avoid the worst of the worst of the climate crisis, we need to get off of all fossil fuels. Yes, so yes. that includes oil and gas. Okay. And uh, I think we recognize that you can't do that today, you can't do that tomorrow, there's a process involved with it, but we need to get more serious about what that process looks like. All right. So I thank you very much. I'm going to, to call this aspect, uh, this, this part of the debate to a close. I think we're about 10 minutes out, um, and that gives us just enough time to go to um, the uh, closing comments. Uh, let's see, make sure I'm in the right space here. Um, forgive me, I want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, so have any minds been changed? Uh, who's won the vote? No, we need to do the closing comments. I, for, I don't have those on here. Where are they? All right, closing comments. We're going to go in the same order. Uh, I need two minutes on the timer, please. And uh, Mark, you'll begin. Closing comment for the proposition. <laughs> All right. Um, a, a couple years ago, uh, I gave a talk that was uh, entitled uh, Learning to Love Hydraulic Fracturing. And I, I tried to present a sort of a balanced view and, you know, taking some time to expand on the kinds of comments uh, I made today. And at the end of the talk, I admitted to the audience that I don't love hydraulic fracturing, and, and, and no one should. Uh, but it's also not something to fear. Um, it, it's used as sort of a scare tactic, um, you know, to push back against the oil and gas industry. And, and, you know, you have to push back against the oil and gas industry. I think a lot of their behavior is, is less than admirable. And, and there's no question that, you know, denying climate change is, has really impeded progress and uh, has, you know, strongly affected the political process in ways that I'm personally not, not happy with. But that's not the issue. The issue is hydraulic fracturing. And, I, you know, if, if anything, I hope you've learned today that when we look at the global energy climate environment challenge, the single most important thing we can do right now is to switch from coal to natural gas. And that involves hydraulic fracturing. That is not the end, it is a tactic in the long-term, you know, and difficult challenge to decarbonize the energy system. We have to do it, there's no question, but it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be glib. We can't just say, okay, let's do it and, and you know, disallow hydraulic fracturing. Let's do it and shut down the oil industry tomorrow, okay? It's all going to happen, but it's going to take some time for it to happen in a responsible way. Thank you. Very good. Well done, Mark. Thank you. So, closing comments. Uh, Two we minutes. didn't even get a chance to talk about some of the very specific local impacts that I wanted to highlight. So, I will just say if any of you ever want to do a tour of a fracking community, if you haven't had the chance to, lean them off it with Sierra Club. Feel free to email me. I would love to take you to meet with some of our chapter mem members in Pennsylvania whose lives have been dramatically negatively impacted by the fracking industry. And I would say, if they were here, they would strongly disagree with Mark's comments and say the fracking industry is very much to be feared. And the US public is starting to agree with that. Uh, the support for fracking has decreased pretty significantly over the past couple of years as more and more people are directly exposed to it. That includes families who have to deal with wells that are literally adjacent to their houses with 24-7 drilling noise, stadium lights that never go off, that present real nuisances to people's lives, which I know isn't something that we necessarily consider as we're looking at the global energy landscape, but I think it should be, particularly when we look at the alternatives. Right now, the cost of solar is plummeting. It's dropped 70% over the past five years and the solar industry added jobs 10 times faster than the rest of the US economy last year. We can do this, the rest of the world is doing it without natural gas. China is going to invest $360 billion in truly decarbonized renewable energy before 2020. They're now making 75% of the world's solar panels. We are losing out on that opportunity to bolster our economy, to create zero carbon energy sources and create millions of jobs the more that we spend time investing in oil and gas infrastructure and fracking. And that infrastructure that we're, we're building right now isn't just a temporary bridge, it's gonna be around for the next century. That is a long-term investment that we just can't afford. 
And add to that all the public health impacts and local impacts we've talked about, I would stress again that I think the impacts of fracking vastly outweigh the benefits. Very good, thank you. You may clap, of course. Uh, closing arguments okay. for the resolution. Two minutes. She's just so good. Uh, I, I, I guess before I even get going, I, I, I guess her arguments are kind of at the nut of what, why I'm here. It, there are a bunch of proof points. Um, fact is, you know, 85,000 pe uh, people a year die from automobile accidents, but we're not in uproar. You take one case out in isolation and make an entire argument around it, doesn't make it true. So uh, today we, we have uh, heard three main arguments against fracking. Uh, one, it pollutes uh, our water. Two, it causes earthquakes. Uh, three, it accelerates climate change. That's the nut of it. So the first one, uh, fracking pollutes our water. Yep, there are cases where that has happened. Um, can't deny that. Um, there are definitely in almost every industry, there are accidents and um, there's abuses, but uh, you know, EPA also admitted that there's huge gaps in the data determining whether or not it's systemic. And uh, we need better data, wouldn't disagree on that. But I would contend that uh, the ca uh, water contamination, for the most part, could be addressed with best practices, better oversight, and common sense regulations. So uh, the second argument, fracking causes earthquakes. Nope. Um, there is little evidence uh, that this is the case, uh, but in fact, injecting produced water into the class two wells does. So like, that's a real, in some rare cases. Um, so just getting the facts. La third, fracking accelerates climate change. Not really. Uh, they argue that methane leaks negate the benefits of CO2. However, that's, that's just not true. Um, they argue that continued use of fo fossil fuel production investments uh, prevents investments in renewables. Also not true. Um, so anyway, now comparing their arguments to ours, I'll follow up, I'll finish up quickly here. Um, what, what do we know? We know that we've replaced coal and we've reduced our carbon emissions. We know uh, that the U.S. is almost energy independent now. We know that we contributed significantly to uh, our economy. Um, folks, folks ma uh, facts matter. Um, we're in a culture war. I hope you reject uh, the false narrative in which truth doesn't matter. So ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to uh, make facts matter again and vote yes uh, on the motion. All right, very good. Thank you, Dean. So final co closing comment, Brianna, against the resolution. Two minutes. Thanks. So, you know, this is an anomaly, a debate about hydraulic fracturing for fossil fuels, but I think you know, partly focusing on these little silos instead of the bigger picture is what's gotten us into this problem. So, you know, debating the merits of using fossil fuels seems to me a little bit like debating the merits of continuing to use landline telephones. You know, we can have that debate, but given that pretty much everyone out here is sitting there with a smartphone in their pocket, it sort of misses the forest for the trees. Um, you know, the question isn't whether we're gonna stop using fossil fuels, it's how fast are we gonna do it, and how can we do it in a way that reduces the impacts to our economy and to our way of life the most? Um, you know, and if you believe the world's climate scientists, the answer to how fast is basically as fast as we can possibly do it. Mm. Um, you know, there's no question that the fossil fuel era has brought about unprecedented advancements in technology and human society. And the sort of ironic thing about that is it's those very advancements that the fossil fuel era has brought about that's gonna to lead to its demise. We are gonna stop using them. We are gonna move past that. And that is fundamentally a good thing. We shouldn't have any nostalgia or sentimentality about the fossil fuel era. We should gladly leave it in our rear view mirror. And no matter which scale of impacts you're talking about, whether it's the very real local impacts to real people that happen that Lena has been talking about, or whether it's the global scale impacts that are happening to our whole planet and our species because of climate change, the environmental costs of fracking for oil and gas vastly outweigh the benefits. All right, very good, thank you. Now, have any minds been changed? Uh, who won the vote? Let's find out. Let's see if I can do this properly. All right, and I need to open the voting up. 
All right, so please, uh, there we go, the poll is active. Please get out your devices, go to slido.com, enter pound sign debate 2017. Actually, I don't think you put the pound sign in, just debate 2017, and make your vote. Please read them carefully. As you can see what we're trying to do here is see if we can determine a winner. Um, but uh, while the votes are being counted, let me, uh, let me do a, a, a couple of logistical instructions for the next set of panels. Uh, we are at 1 o'clock. Uh, the next panels begin at 1.10. If you're moving to another room, I'd ask you to please clean up a little bit. Don't go yet. Uh, and uh, we have a few more minutes before we vote in, before we're back in this room. Please keep voting. I'm going to close momentarily. Panelists. You've done an excellent job. Thank you so both very much. <laughs> Win or lose, what do you say, audience? <laughs> Thank you so much for your energy and your efforts and for being here today. Mark just got back from overseas. These two ladies flew in in the last couple of days. And I know you had to, to, to uh, um, do the traffic across the bay to get here this morning. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, there's still some votes coming in. I'm gonna shut that down. And let's put up the results. My opinion is unchanged wins. And that's not too surprised, but the undecided has gotten smaller. But look at that. We are absolutely split on the opinions having changed to agree or disagree. So I guess uh, by the narrowest of var margins, we have a tie. Thank you both very much. Thank you all very much. That's amazing.